Hello, my name is Jonathan Clark. Welcome to another video in my basic audio recording tutorial series. This is video number seven, lucky number seven. Today we're going to learn about MIDI. And what is MIDI? Well, MIDI stands for Musical Instrument Digital Interface. And the fact that I can often not remember what it stands for shows you how important it is to, need to know that. Um, what you do need to know is that MIDI is amazing. There's a lot of stuff that you can do with it in the studio and you don't really have to know much about the technical side of it to take advantage of it. And so we're going to do a little production today where I'm going to play a song on the piano and that is going to come out of the piano by MIDI interface, by MIDI uh, transfer protocol, and it's going to get into the computer that way instead of as audio information and we'll manipulate it that way, we'll, uh, you'll be quite amazed with what happens. Now, if you haven't watched any of the first six videos in the series, uh, you don't probably have to watch those to understand or to benefit from this video. If you want to, <clears throat> you can certainly go back and watch those first. Um, but no, this is a pretty standalone video. Now, so basically what MIDI is, MIDI was I think it was designed as a standard in 1983, and it was designed as a communications protocol. So it's just a way for different instruments to talk to each other, uh, different electronic instruments to talk to each other. And so a bunch of companies got together and came up with this protocol so that each individual manufacturer could make instruments that were able to communicate, which is good because musicians were having a really hard time with, uh, with different instruments synthesizers, uh, hardware, stuff like that, effects pedals, trying to get it to communicate. It was, it was a real nightmare back then, apparently. And so, so that's what MIDI was designed for, to standardize things and make it easier for everyone to use it. Now, when you're working with MIDI, you'll often hear the term controller. And so what is a controller? Well, a controller can be a lot of different things. Basically, it's a piece of hardware, of, like a physical device, electronic device, and it uses MIDI information to talk to other things. Now, controllers can come in thousands of different sizes, shapes, forms, and they have all kinds of different uses. So a common controller would be a keyboard. And most electronic keyboards have MIDI capability. And so what happens is not only can they send out an audio signal, uh, through their line outputs on the back of the machine, back of the keyboard, or audio, audible audio out through the speakers, but they can usually also send MIDI information out the, uh, out the back. And so keyboard controllers, when, when you hear the phrase keyboard controller, it usually means to, it refers to piano type of keyboard, not to computer type of keyboard. Okay, but there's lots of other types of controllers. Like for DJs, there's controllers like the Akai APC40, Novation Launchpad, Ableton's Push Controller. They're all weird uh, control control surfaces, sometimes is what they're called too. And they just have all sorts of weird knobs, dials, levers, faders, uh, rotary knobs, push buttons, all sorts of stuff. And you can hook them up to your computer or to other gear and you know, an example is for one of those DJ controllers, a DJ will hook it up to their laptop, and if they're playing music off a laptop, by pushing buttons on this controller or manipulating controls, stuff will happen in the software. So it kind of is an extension of your mouse or an extension of your keyboard. It gives you more versatility because, you know, if you're in a mixing situation as a DJ, it's kind of hard to fix the volumes on a whole bunch of things almost simultaneously with a mouse or with keys on the keyboard. But if you have some sort of tactile surface that you can plug in, a control surface, then you can manipulate faders maybe on the surface, which is a lot more intuitive, it makes sense, and it's faster and more convenient, efficient. So controllers come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. I've got another video online which is designed a little bit more for DJs, but it talks about generic MIDI controllers. If you want to, it's probably worth watching that. I'll put a link down here right now, but you don't necessarily need that right now. Now, in terms, of, uh, in terms of my videos online, I've got kind of different focuses. I've got a lot of videos that are designed for DJs. I've got this basic audio recording series. And for people watching this basic audio recording series, 
most of the time, if you're working with MIDI, you're going to be using a piano type of keyboard, a synthesizer. Um, and something that's confusing for some people is you'll see advertisements for a synth controller, or for a controller, or for a synth. And what are the differences? Well, a standalone electronic keyboard, piano sort of thing, um, can have two functions in it. It can either have synthesis capabilities, and what that means is when you play it, it has the ability to produce sounds. Or it can have controller capabilities, and if it's a controller only, it has the capability to produce MIDI notes which can go to other equipment to make the noise. But a controller by itself, and, and of course there's keyboard instruments that are both controllers and synths, which is probably most common, I would think, nowadays. Um, te technology, yeah, things have changed a lot in the last few years. So most of the time your keyboard will be a controller and a synth, but there was a time, um, I mean, it's still possible to get controllers that are only a controller. And it's kind of odd. You go out and you buy this keyboard controller, and it looks like a piano, and you think, oh, I can make music. And people do that, and they don't realize all it is is something that creates this MIDI information to send to other things. And so you have to have something at the other end, a destination, either a synth module, or maybe you can feed the signal into a laptop, and, and uh, that signal can go into your audio editor and you can put an instrument on it that way and you can get sound out of it that way. But some controllers have no sound. Okay, so that's important to know. Uh, so yeah, the controllers video, you can watch that if you want, but uh, moving forward with MIDI information, you don't really need to know that much about the technical background behind it. It's uh, I mean, some of these videos that I'm doing in the series, I'm going into a lot of detail about sound, um, about samples, about all sorts of uh, theories and stuff relating to sound, and it seems like that might be less important than understanding how MIDI works. No, I don't think that's the case. It's good to know how audio works. With MIDI, it's so transparent these days that if you're just doing a simple setup where you're, you've got an instrument a simple instrument, a simple keyboard or something that works, you're feeding it straight into a computer or something like that, you don't really need to know the technical background. I can give you the 30 second explanation. Um, basically there's all sorts of different um, signals, note data, whatever, control data, and pieces of information that come out of your uh, MIDI controller. Okay, so there's, you can look at charts online that show what all these different types of information mean. But basically it's kind of broken down into things like control messages or note data. And so for control messages, you might have, uh, you might have messages that say things like um, change tempo to 123. Uh, you might have a control message that is turn all notes off. You might have one that says change channel to channel 14. Okay, and then the note data. Note data is a little bit different. It'll send a note saying play the fourth C on the keyboard, C4. Um, it might say make the note last for such and such length of time. Stuff like that. And if your keyboard is a fancy one that has things like aftertouch, it might send signals that describe what kind of uh, aftertouch activity is happening. Or sustained pedal activity, all sorts of stuff. But you don't really have to know the technical background behind all that works. Just know that the information gets out there. Now, when you get into your editor on your computer, you can look at it. And the way it's set up, usually it doesn't look like... Uh, it's not in waveform data, the type of um, audio file appearance, waveform appearance that we've used in other videos in the series so far. Instead, it's more like you'll see a chart and usually there's a piano keyboard laid out on the side with the keys vertically in rows so if you turned your head it would look like a keyboard and by seeing how high on the screen a note is or a key on the piano is you can see what the pitch is and then on your track 
in your audio editor, you'll see little bars, and that represents the notes that you've played on the piano. So I think the easiest way to to really make sense of this is for me to just do it. Um, well, let me explain just a little bit more. The nice thing about MIDI is that it's easier to, uh, to edit MIDI data on a lot of instruments than it is to edit the actual audio. Now, with the actual audio, if you try to cut a note, say I'm playing a really complex uh, piece by Chopin, if I try to cut a single note out of that, I can't really, because in real life, audio signals interact with each other. And so the waveforms clash, they kind of mix up. It would be, I don't know a good analogy, but it, you know, it's hard to pull a single note out of a performance. You saw me perhaps editing in the, uh, in the last video, one of the last videos I did, and you saw how easy it was because I was always playing one note at a time in the bass when I was doing all that chopping up. It's not easy when you've got a full, full band or a full instrument, uh, like a multi-timbral, multi-toned, polyphonic instrument playing. Uh, the reason why MIDI is easier is because MIDI is the underlying information. The, it describes what notes were pressed and how long and how hard and stuff like that. But there's no audio information until you send the MIDI data out through some sort of module or external synth or something that understands MIDI and plays audio based on what note data is going through it. In a computer situation, there are things called plugins, and what you can do is insert or drop a plugin onto one of your MIDI tracks inside your audio editor, and it's basically the same as if you had a physical module that you're running MIDI data through. And so the MIDI data goes through this software plugin, software app, whatever you want to call it, um, and it creates sound. So usually the things I work with are called VSTIs, and it stands for Virtual Studio Technology Instrument. Now you may have heard of VSTs in general before. VSTs usually are referred to as uh, different types of effects, like you can have a, a VST that's a reverb or a VST that's a, um, a delay or something like that. Well, the VSTIs, very similar concept, a software app that goes in your computer that can be added to your audio editor and your VSTI can sound like anything. It could sound like a trumpet. It could sound like a piano. And so when the MIDI note goes through it, the sound of a piano or the sound of a trumpet comes out. And it's beautiful because you can then go and edit your MIDI data, which is still on the screen, before it gets routed through your VSTI. And so you'll be able to fix your notes. And then once the stuff goes through the VSTI and gets converted into audio output, then everything's kind of mixed together. And at that point, it would be very difficult to edit stuff. But when it's still in its basic MIDI form on the screen, it's easy to edit. And quite often, MIDI data appears on a grid within the software. And that's because a lot of times people use MIDI for very rigid structures like dance music, where very even beats, segmented stuff, and, you know, stuff that would be played to a metronome would probably show up on a grid. But it's not just for electronica, by all means. There's, you'd be shocked, there's thousands and thousands of songs that you've heard on the radio that would feature piano players, um, drummers, trumpet players, stuff like that, and you think, well, they're playing a piano, or they're playing the drums, or whatever. Some of that stuff was actually programmed using a mouse, or by playing it on a keyboard. And what they do is they drop a different type of instrument or they drop a drum kit or something, VSTI drum kit, onto the track and it produces a sound that you totally don't expect. So it's very powerful, very, very, very 
cool what you can do. I mean, it had a bad name in the in the 1980s when it first came out as not being high quality, because back then they were working with computers that were a lot uh, less versatile. A lot of 8-bit computers and stuff like that didn't have good sounds. Um, so at the time, musicians looked at MIDI as being kind of almost a novelty in some ways. MIDI for them was very useful when they were using it just as communications between devices to get their synth to talk to a different synth, stuff like that. But as far as actually routing MIDI note data into something and playing audio, a lot of musicians looked at it, looked down on MIDI and thought it wasn't that great. But in today's world, with today's computers, it's just phenomenally amazing what you can do with it. And most of the stuff, you know, if I were today to put out a whole series of videos of me playing the piano, put them out on YouTube, I would not ever use audio anymore. I would always use MIDI. And you'll see by the end of this video just how powerful it is, what, what we can do with it. Uh, so that's basically how it works. Let's, uh, let's open up the computer and uh, set up a session, and that's the easiest way to uh, actually, let's learn. So how does MIDI talk to, how does a MIDI instrument talk to your computer? Well, generally, you take a MIDI chord, and it's just a standard type of audio chord, and it has an end on it, which is uh, known as a 5-pin D-I-N pin. And so, actually, I'll set it up right now. What we'll do is we'll plug the chord into the back of the piano, and then the other end of the chord will plug into the back of my sound card, and from the sound card, the information goes through the USB cable back into the computer, like we've seen before. Now, it's important to understand that the MIDI information goes on that MIDI chord, and audio information goes through the line out chords. So I can actually record what I'm playing on the piano, I can record it into the computer twice at the same time because I can set up one track which will receive the MIDI data through the MIDI cable through the which then goes through the USB interface into the laptop and simultaneously I can set up another stereo track as an audio track and the line outs from the keyboard will be sending information to the USB card and through into the computer. So as long as I have my routing all set up, those are two totally separate signals. If you have an audio line going to your sound card, you cannot send MIDI information through it. If you have a MIDI cord only hooked up to your keyboard and to your sound card, you cannot send audio information through it. They are totally different things independent of each other, although they can happen simultaneously. Okay, so today we're going to also um, switch and try using a different editor. Uh, now there's a lot of audio editing software out there. There's, uh, like some of the programs that I use commonly would be Cubase, Pro Tools, Audition, Audacity, Sonar, Ableton, uh, Reason, I'm sure I'm missing a few too. Um, I mean, we started out with Audacity. It's free, it's easy to use. Uh, I switched to Audition for the last couple of videos. Again, a very easy to use software package and pretty comprehensive. And uh, I mean, Adobe's always had pretty decent software. But if you're looking in the professional world, the, uh, the DAW that you have to look at as being the most uh, ubiquitous and most common uh, DAW anywhere is without question, is Pro Tools for studio use. So Pro Tools is one of the highest end. Uh, it's got the most capabilities. It's, when you look at the version that's used in, you know, in low-end environments, home studios, or fairly simple professional studios, that software, um, once you get familiar with that, the advantage is you can you know, you can transform into a, uh, an environment with a professional system and you're familiar with what everything is doing. But Pro Tools is used in 
studios with you know half million dollar control boards and stuff like that so it's very very comprehensive what it can do uh is it the only high-end one no no uh definitely not i mean i use if if i had a choice of using say just three of the daws for for traditional audio work i would restrict myself to um to cubase pro tools and and probably audition i mean auditions quick and easy for a lot of tasks Pro Tools uh, is good because it's compatible with other industry stuff. And Cubase, I just like Cubase. Uh, but on top of that, I mean, don't don't take that to, don't take that to mean that some of the other packages are not useful. Ableton Live, for example. I mean, even though I just didn't list that one, uh, I use that more than every other package combined. But I use that for a different focus. I use that more for electronica, uh, beats-based music, stuff like that, and DJing. So anyway, Pro Tools, uh, high-end package. So let's uh, let's take a look. Let's open it up and see what we have. Uh, see what we have. So when Pro Tools first opens, you have a couple different choices. We're going to start a new blank session. We're going to call it Mad World. Okay, and so this is what you get when you first open things up. Now, is this a similar layout to Audition? Yes, fairly similar. And, uh, and by the way, I'm going to try and use different DAWs in a lot of the upcoming videos, so you get to see quite a few different ones. I might even do a comparison video, actually. Uh, anyway, this thing here is called the transport bar. And we already saw something like that in Audition. And when I was using it, it was embedded in Audition but you can have it as a floating floating device. Now, the uh, the screen is pretty simple. This is session view. Now, if you hit control equal, you get a mixer. Now, right now, my mixer doesn't have anything, so let's close that. Uh, I think what I'll do is I'll set up a session first. That's the easiest way to make things make more sense. With Audition, you've already got um, channels laid out when you start out. Now, with Pro Tools, I'm going to create a track, new. I'm going to make it stereo. And instead of an audio track, we have a lot of different choices. Auxiliary input, master fader, uh, MIDI track, instrument track. Now, I'm trying to demonstrate MIDI here. But normally what happens with MIDI is you get a MIDI track that contains the MIDI note data. And that's not audio and then you get a separate track where you drop your instrument onto the track and you have to route the MIDI note data from your MIDI track into the instrument track and then the instrument track behaves like an audio track. The, the way the Pro Tools does it, you can do it that way. You can have a separate MIDI track and that's useful in some cases, but quite often I would say the majority of the time, when people are working with MIDI, they want to have an instrument dropped on it. Okay, that's common. Yes, you could have, as an example, let's say you had a MIDI track and you just wanted to put a bunch of MIDI effects on it that did stuff like note splitting and all sorts of stuff, and then that MIDI track sent data out to three or four separate tracks, and each of those was an audio track. So that would be a unique situation, possible. But most of the time, you just have a simple track with MIDI data and you want to run it through a single instrument. So Pro Tools has this option called an instrument track which basically combines a standalone MIDI track and the instrumentation part. So I'm going to do that to make it easy. Now ticks or samples are choices. Samples you know about uh, a little bit. You'll certainly know more after my next couple of theory videos. Um, so if I have that set at samples, and I've got my session set at 44,100 samples per second, my time scale up at the top is going to show uh, information in samples as a scale. Ticks, ticks would be useful for beat-based music with a grid, electronica-based music, um, or if you're playing music where you want to go to a rigid uh, tempo, to a metronome. But I'm just going to kind of freeform piano 
So we'll keep it at samples, and I'm going to go create. Okay, that looks good. Now I can drag this to make it a little bit bigger. And right now, um, if I go up to View, Edit Window Views, I've actually already got two things turned on. So let's turn those off for a second. This is normally what the instrument would look like when it shows up. And remember how I said it's always a good idea to name your tracks as soon as you create them? Well, I'm double-clicking there, and I'm going to name this Piano. Okay. Okay, that's good. Now, let's show what we have for instruments. Because, in order to hear MIDI data, you have to have an instrument on the track. So, do I want to see the instruments here? No. Actually, this is a little bit misleading, um, the way this is set up, and I'll explain why in a little bit. But uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off instruments. What we're going to do instead is we're going to show the inserts, because what I'm going to do eventually is insert a plugin of VSTi onto this track. Okay, but for now, I don't have to do that yet. It just means that I won't be able to get any sound out of this at the moment because there's no instrument on it. So what do I have to do to, uh, to record? Well, first I have to click Record Enable, Track Record Enable. If that is not turned on, when I try to record note data into my track, nothing happens. And then I hit Record up here, Record Enable. That's to start the entire session recording. And, uh, and that's pretty much all I have to do. So let me get the piano set up, and once we're ready to go, I'm just going to click on the play button, and that will start the recording process, and it will record our, uh, our song.
All right, let's put the headphones on. Uh, I need to have those on because of the way that the video is working, so I can hear. Um, let's uh, get to work. Okay, so first of all, here's our MIDI note data. You can see uh, scrolling up and down. I've got a keyboard on my left side here. You can see one, two, that refers to which octave we're in on the keyboard. Three, four, um, that seems a little low. It may be displaced by one octave, but that's something you can fix. That's the neat thing. Uh, let's try pressing play and see what it sounds like so far. Well, we're not hearing anything, and why is that? That's because we don't have anything inserted yet. All we have so far is MIDI note data. So, I'm going to insert a VSTi on the track. So I'm going to click here, multi-channel plug-in. I'm going to go down and instrument. What have we got? Absinthe, boom, mini grand, structure free. So we've got all these different things. Uh, I won't get into what each one is, but they're all different types of instruments, plugins. But the one we're interested in comes as a, a default option with Pro Tools. It's called Mini Grand. Oh, that looks kind of funny. Now, let's, uh, let's put a transport bar up there. And let's press play and see what it sounds like. Do we get any sound? Oh. Okay, so there's all these different settings on the Mini Grand. Let's see what they sound like. This is going to sound a lot better if you're listening in headphones or on really good speakers. If you're just listening on a phone, mobile phone or something like that, or laptop speakers, you're not going to hear a lot of the uh, what I'm talking about. Soft. Atmospheric. Okay, so over here we have an option of changing our room size, and what does that mean? Well, that would be reverb, and our mix right now is at mostly more on the dry side. Let's put it completely dry for a second while we're listening to the pianos again. I think I like the bright piano the best. Now, dynamic response. So basically, maximum dynamic response means it pays attention to how hard I was pressing the keys. Some keyboard controllers and some pianos don't have sensitivity on their keys. It's either on or off for the uh, whenever you press a key. So if you're a piano player, you do not want to get a keyboard that does not that is not touch sensitive. Anyway, this one's touch sensitive, so I can press the keys harder and get different uh, sounds out of it. So if we set it to minimum. It kind of just assumes that you're at full volume every time you hit a key. But now let's put it on a uh, more dynamic response. Okay, and then like I said, we have our built-in reverb. So I could uh, assume that I'm playing in a small space, bright. Let's see what happens when we move mix up to 100%. Okay, let's put it on studio. Put it on Hall. Hall would obviously be a very large space. Um, let's go with Chamber. I think that's a good compromise I like. And let's see how much I want it to... Okay, 
Okay, that's probably good. And then finally, level is the volume. Okay, those are the settings that I like. Now, if I didn't want to go with those, um, I could check the drop down menu and try out some different settings. I won't bother since we've got it set where I like. Um, so, let's move the piano down out of the way, and we will see what we can do with editing. I'm going to hit Control s to save right now first. Okay, let's go into editing mode. Um, actually, I think what I'll do is I will play the song. Oh, actually, before we get into editing mode, look up here. We have different timelines. Now, when I played this, I did not play according to any sort of metronome. So, showing bars and beats along the top of the menu here is kind of useless. I wish there was a way to see something a little bit more useful to me, like how many minutes and seconds I actually took. Well, I can go down here and I can turn on minutes and seconds. And that is now my default, uh, well, well, sorry, it's not my default, but it's one of my different timelines up here. Now, do I want to make, uh, how do I do that? Okay, so I have, by moving this thing, there, I got rid of the bars and beats. Basically, you can have as many different uh, you can have as many different timelines at the top as you want. Uh, is it useful for me to have the tempo 120? Well, no, because this is not electronic music. We're not changing tempo as we go. Meter. I'm going to turn that off. Markers. I do like the idea of markers. I'll show you why in a minute. And what about samples? Well, remember how I was talking when we set up the track, we had the option of ticks or samples? Well, you can see here, the samples, uh, the number of samples are displayed at the top. Perhaps not that useful when we're talking about 2 million samples when you're only 45 seconds into the song. But if I wanted to, I could zoom in very, very fine detail. Um, and in that kind of case, the samples menu, samples ruler might be useful. But I'm going to take it off. Really, all I want is the minutes and seconds and the markers. Now, for markers, you see this little plus key. That adds a marker or memory location. What I'm going to do is go through this, and I'm going to listen to the song, and I'm going to add a couple markers where key events are happening, like a verse change, and I'm going to name them as such. And I'm going to add a few other markers where there's problems with the notes that I want to fix. Okay? So let's give it a shot.
Okay, I think that's good enough. I mean, there's a ton of uh, little mistakes in there, but uh, we don't need to do a major, major editing job here. I just want to show you the very basics here. Now, uh, mistake. Let's zoom in and see if we can figure out exactly where that mistake is. Now, can we also make our keyboard bigger? Uh, yes. This is starting to get more helpful. Okay, I think I see the mistake. Okay, so why is that a mistake? Which is the bad note? I'm not sure what's... We'll take a look at the, uh, our last chord here. And what have we got? We've got four notes. Now, I can go over to this drop down and see velocity. And velocity, what is velocity? Well, it's very closely related to the volume, but it is absolutely not the same, two totally different things. Now, the reason I say they're related is because when you have a higher velocity on a note, it usually ends up meaning more volume when it plays. Now, velocity usually is um, listed in a value from 0 to 127. That's pretty common. That seems kind of odd. Why not 1 to 100? Well, think back to binary, and remember MIDI was designed back in the days of 8-bit in the 1980s. And so I think what they usually did was they took 7 bits out of the 8 bits and used that as your um, as your scale in the velocity, and so you get 0 to 127, and usually 127 would be the hardest a note is hit, and 0 is the softest. And so obviously if you hit a note harder, it is going to sound louder most of the time. But it also um, impacts some other things. Um, for instance, in some software, in some uh, plugins, what happens is you have, uh, generally, generally what happens is the plugin has to play a note when the note data comes through it. 
And so the plugin has all these recorded samples in it. And so, like for instance, a D note on a piano, they'll play it a whole bunch of times at harder and harder volumes. They'll record each one. And so they'll assign these different samples to the different uh, to that note at different velocities. So as a D note comes through at whatever velocity, the appropriate sample plays back. And that's what you hear when the VSTI is playing. So with some instruments, depending on how you hit them, you can get different sounds. Like for a piano, if you hit it softly, you don't get much of an attack on the note. But if you hit it hard, there's a little bit more of a sharp attack. Now, if I were to play a D note several times, starting softly and going harder and harder each time, generally what's going to happen when it gets played back by the VSTI is not only will the volume come up when I start hitting harder, but it might go to a different type of sample that plays a sample with more of an attack. Okay, so velocity related to volume, but also separate. Um, okay, what was the point of that? Oh yeah, so now that I've turned on velocity, you can see these lollipops. Now, if I play here, Watch what happens if I raise the velocity of one of the notes. Okay, so that one note kind of really overpowers the chord. And I can turn it way down so you can barely hear it. Okay, so that's one type of editing you can do. You can edit your velocity. I can change the start of a note. I can change the end of the note. I can change the length. Um, without changing one of the, you know, if I change the note length by typing in a different note length in the right area, then it figures out where the end has to be, so I don't have to actually set the end in the beginning. I can set the beginning and set a note length, and it figures out how long. Uh, yeah, there's lots of things that you can change here. So, for instance, with this note starting late, oh, and so is that one. Can I change that to make them all start at the same time. Yes, I can. Okay, I could even, you can see over here on the uh, left side, the piano keyboard, depending how high my pencil is, um, if I want to draw something, different notes will highlight. Now what if I wanted to try in a couple extra notes here? Um, it's not highlighting properly. Oh, because we're in velocity mode, of course. So if I go back into note mode, and let's say I want to add some notes, you can see right now where my pencil is. If you follow over to the left, that B is highlighted. So this is a B note that I can draw in. And I can draw in a... Uh, was that a B note? Oh, sorry, that was an E. Looking at the wrong thing. Okay, so we've got a D note we'll add. We'll add an extra B, we'll add down here, we'll add an extra D, and yet another G. Okay, those aren't quite lined up exactly even, but probably close enough for our purposes. Now, you can see that they're very short right now. Okay, so that doesn't sound very natural. So what I should do next is go in and add extra length to my notes. And... Okay, let's see what it sounds like now. Okay, so that's a little overpowering. That's a lot of notes, and uh, probably too much. Now I could maybe... So I've got a lot of note velocities on top of each other there. 
Uh, that sounds better with the notes down lower. Okay, so you can see I can change all sorts of stuff with the notes. If I wanted to, I could actually um, pretty much rewrite the entire um, the entire composition by by hand. I don't even necessarily have to play it on a piano. I can go in, draw every single note painstakingly on the chart, and then I can add what I think is the right velocity levels, all that sort of stuff, and create an entire composition with my mouse. Is that smart? No. It's much easier to learn to play the piano and to do that, and then just do little touch-ups with your mouse. Okay, so I'm going to turn velocity off, and one last thing that I'll show you is um, in our last video, we did a little stuff with, uh, with EQing. Okay, can we still do that? Sure, let's put an extra insert on here. We'll go with a seven band EQ. And Okay, so that's how you add a um, add extra instruments. I could add also I could add a reverb, although that's maybe dangerous because the piano already has some natural reverb on it um, because of that uh, because of this wet dry mix and the room setting on it. There's all kinds of things we can do. So so this is just a quick example. I don't think I'm going to show you any more about this because you basically understand what MIDI can do now. I didn't want to get into a big project here because some of the last videos have been so uh, so in-depth, so complicated. But I did want to show you the process of recording something very simple, how the VSTIs work, how a MIDI note grid works. And I think eventually what we'll do is we'll do some other comp compositions, but I'll pick some songs where I can use a vocalist. And so we'll do you know a couple different MIDI tracks, different instruments, EQing, bring in a vocalist, and we'll make more of a production out of it. In the meantime, now that you know the basics, I would recommend that you go and do some extra research on the internet and play with it a little bit, depending on which other, whichever audio editor you happen to have. Now, Pro Tools, um, one question you'll probably have right now is, if you don't already have an audio editor, what should you get? And I should have addressed this before. Uh, that is a difficult question to answer. It's really hard for me to make a recommendation, to be honest, um, because I use so many different ones. Audacity is free, so a lot of you will want to use Audacity, but its capabilities are also limited in some ways. Um, Pro Tools, it'd be great if you could all afford Pro Tools, but Pro Tools costs a lot of money, and uh, I'm quite sure it's out of the range of most of you. If I had to make a recommendation, um, I would suggest that you check into, do some investigating into a newer piece of software called Reaper. Um, it hasn't been long around for too many years. It's fairly recent, but I have heard good things about it. Now, to be honest, I have not used it at all, but it's, uh, it's fairly cheap. I think a, a personal license is only $60, and I believe it's a full-fledged audio editor. So look into that. Don't buy it just on my recommendation. Do some due diligence on your own. But I will also try to look into myself, and if I can, in the coming months, I will do a tutorial on it, and I'll give you more feedback. But that's something to look at, at least. Okay? One other thing that I should tell you, too, is how the file directory structure works with Pro Tools, because I will save this on the uh, as a download if you want to play with this, if you happen to have Pro Tools. 
MIDI data is extremely small. There's no audio data with it. It's just note on off information. It's absolutely tiny. This whole song, I have no idea how much space it would take, but it's probably only a couple kilobytes at the most. On the other hand, if I had exported this as an audio file, two and a half minutes, remembering that audio data, CD quality, wave format, 44.1 kilohertz sampling rate, 16-bit sample size, takes 10 megs per minute of data. So this would be about 25 megabytes or 25,000 kilobytes, whereas the MIDI data will take a couple kilobytes. Okay, now, so Pro Tools saves the MIDI data right inside the session file, but it's okay because you can export that. So I'm going to highlight all, I'm going to go to File, Export, MIDI, MIDI file format. It's only one track, so I'll go single track. I'm going to hit OK. I'll save it on the desktop for now, and I'll call it Mad World. Save. And we will close. And let's see what happens when we uh, when we can see the desktop again. Uh, okay, so we've got this file up here, and there it is, madworld.mid. Okay, so it takes 11 kilobytes. That's tiny. Now, within the directory structure of a Pro Tools session itself. Um, we'll double click. There's the Mad World folder. And we have a PTX file. That's the Pro Tools version 10, version X. Uh, that's the Pro Tools session file. And then plugin settings, mini grand. See, there's not even any plugin settings because there's nothing important to save. This is going to be a tiny, tiny download, extremely tiny. Um, but what I'll do before I zip it is I'll go to the desktop, I'll drag and drop the Mad World MIDI in there. So it's actually in this folder twice now because we have a standalone MIDI file which you can download and you can load into any other audio editor if you want to play with it. And the MIDI is also captured within the Mad World session. So it's there twice. So I'll zip those and uh, that'll give you something to play with. Yeah, so I think that's about all I want to tell you for today. Um, you've got the basics now on how MIDI works. Best thing to do is experiment with it. You can download the files that I created there today. Um, I'll put the link in the text description under the YouTube video if you want to download uh, and also in the blog post. And uh, so if you want to play with them, go ahead. But basically, have fun. Try, depending on which system you're, you're using, try setting up different, um, different types of instruments. Don't do just a piano. Play something on a keyboard if you have it, or draw it in using your pencil into your audio editor. But try putting different VSTIs on it. See what happens when you make your uh, use a trumpet sound on a VSTI. Or try some of the drum uh, modules that are out there. You can get all sorts of interesting stuff. Okay, so play with it, have fun, and uh, thanks for watching. And we'll get into MIDI in a lot more detail in some future tutorials. I'll probably set up one eventually where I multi-track and have several different streams of MIDI and we'll bring in a vocalist and we'll process each one, use different VSTIs and stuff like that. Okay, thanks for watching. Cheers.